Hey, welcome to Arch Tech Support. All right, I'm streamlined. I took my glasses off, I took my tie off. We're ready to get down and dirty now, so let's get to work. So we are on the first um, PDF outline, which is uh, the nine sections of the blueprint for the pharmacy technician certification exam. And um, you should have your outline in front of you. Uh, this is going to be 1.0, uh, pharmacology for technicians. So have your uh, outline either printed. Uh, if you have it printed, make sure you have a pen or pencil to fill in the blanks. Or uh, if you're going to do it on your computer while you watch uh, this video lecture, make sure that um, you have your keyboard ready to type in the missing uh, blanks or the answers. Okay, so pharmacology, what is it? Uh, when I was in pharmacy school, that was one of my favorite courses. I, I found that pharmacology, pharmacology, toxicology was a very fascinating course. Um, it's defined as the scientific study of the action of drugs on living organisms. Um, we used to like um, work on hamsters and rabbits, uh, put different kinds of drugs in them, and then study the, the, the outcome, the reactions of what the drugs, uh, the, the drug's pharmacologic effect was on the animals, and then do a lot of uh, note-taking and uh, data collection. Okay. So, pharmacolo pharmacology is defined as a scientific study of the action of drugs in a living organism, organism, and it's a drug that interacts with receptors and produces a biological response. So, let's kind of look at receptor theory. It's sort of like a lock and key, okay? You have your, your lock, and then you have a key that will go in and unlock the lock, and when that happens, you have your biological response. So, uh, the lock would be... Uh, the receptor site that's in the body, and the key would be the drug. The key would go in and un unlock the lock, and then it causes the actual biological response as a result of the receptor um, reacting to the, the drug, the pharmacologic action, as we say. Pharmacokinetics, this involves um, ADME. Remember, remember this mnemonic ADME, A-D-M-E, A-D-M-E. That stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Ad, ADME, ADME. Um, pharmacokinetics is actually a study. Uh, there is actually calculus involved. Uh, it's one of the harder courses in pharmacy school, uh, but again, another fascinating course as you, know, you want to know uh, how the drug, once it enters the body, how it exhibits its action through absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So, you know, elimination is like most drugs, that you either uh, they, they pass through the feces or they come out of uh, the, into the urine. All right, so pharmacokinetics involves the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of a drug in a living organism. 1.1, um, generic and brand names for pharmaceuticals. So this is important. You have a top 200 list that once you sign up for the course, we send you this link on Quizlet uh, that you could use on your phone or your um, iPad or whatever it is that you guys have, Galaxy Notebook. And it's the top 200 drugs that you will be tested on when you take the pharmacy technician certification exam. You have to know these top 200 drugs. You don't have to know the 300 or 400,000 drugs that are, that are in the arsenal for pharmacists in the United States. But you have to know the top 200. And you have to know both names, the generic name, the chemical name, um, and the brand name or proprietary name. So the brand name, the brand name, okay, brand name, that's, that's the, uh, <clears throat> the fill-in, is the trademark or proprietary name. I want you to get all of you, all three, understand all three and know all three. If I say brand name, it also means trademark, and it also means proprietary name, proprietary. So I will give you an example. Cola. Cola is a generic name, but if I say Coca-Cola, that is the brand for cola. If I say tissue paper, tissue paper is a generic name. The brand name would be Kleenex, right? If I said bandages, <clears throat> that's the generic name. But if I gave you a brand name for bandages, it would be Band-Aid, okay? 
So the brand name is the uh, trademark or proprietary name, proprietary name of a drug. Uh, for example, again, Prozac. Prozac is the brand name. It's a Lilly product. It's the brand name for fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is the generic. So I just want to say something here right now. And everywhere that you look, that you see a drug uh, in our review course, it's going to be a top 200 drug. I'm not going to give you some odd drug that, uh, like an orphan drug, that you won't even see in the pharmacy. Every drug that we use in the outlines, in the lectures, and in the math section are all going to be top 200 drugs. So we want to expose you as much as possible along with your little Quizlet that we uh, send to you that you're going to be practicing the top 200 drugs. Remember, Quizlet is your flashcards. If you feel like you uh, are more efficient or it works better for you to actually write down on 3 by 5s the, the, the brand name on one side and the generic name and classification on the other, go for it. Whatever works for you, but you've got to start now to put all 200 of those drugs into your brain before you take this exam. Um, I talked about Coca-Cola, Kleenex, and all that. Okay, so don't forget to remember that you can also use the term trademark or proprietary name when you refer to the brand name of the drug. If I say Prozac, I'm referring to the brand name, proprietary, or trademark name. If I say fluoxetine, I'm referring to the generic name. Okay, every drug is, has actually three names, the brand, the generic, and the chemical name. All right, so the generic name of a drug is the non-proprietary name, the non-branded name. Uh, so again, for example, fluoxetine is the generic name for Prozac. Sildenafil is the generic name for Viagra. Um, Donepazil is the generic name for Aricet, okay? Your top 200 drugs are going to have a generic and brand name. There are some drugs that are really old uh, that don't even have uh, a brand name because it's just, it's just really old. So um, it is the sign, uh, the generic name, the generic name of a drug is a non-proprietary name, write that down or type it in. It is assigned to a medication and contains a word stem that has been issued by the U.S. Adopted Names Council. This is the UANC. So here's a little tip. Whenever you see a tip, okay, I want you to take note of it. Use the flashcards, the ones that you write, or the Quizlet link that I gave you, and you, gotta, you have to download the Quizlet app from either um, Google or um, iTunes, you know, the, the Apple Store. And then, uh, you, and then that app will allow you to go ahead and, and uh, use uh, their app electronically to re review and learn the top 200 drugs. Or, again, use flashcards. So uh, you have to memorize all top 200 that we provide. And also study the generic suffix uh, chart that's in the PDF resources on the website. There will be a, a PDF folder of resources. Uh, they're all PDFs. And um, there's a lot of different resources in there. I would print all those resources up while you go through the course and learn, learn about the resources on there. So learn the generic suffix chart in the PDF resources on the website. C. So lastly, the chemical name of a drug reflects the chemical structure of the compound. You do not, not, uh, you do not have to know the chemical structure. That's for pharmacy school students. They, they learn it in medicinal chem, medicinal chemistry. Uh, this is often complicated, it's extremely lengthy, and it's difficult to remember or pronounce. So luckily, you don't have to learn it. <clears throat> what you have to know is A, brand name, and B, the generic name. Okay, we're on page two, D. So collectively, all three above classification of names comprise what is known as drug nomenclature. Nomenclature is basically how the drug is, is named, how it's given its name. All right, 1.2, therapeutic equivalence. Definition, therapeutic equivalence refers to, a, to drug products that are considered to be pharmaceutical equivalents and if they can be expected to have the same clinical effect and safety profile when administered to patients under the conditions specified in the labeling. So, for example, uh, generic Prozac or fluoxetine must exert the same pharmaceutical and therapeutic effect as the brand name drug. 
uh, Prozac in order to have therapeutic equivalents. And so uh, in, the, in, in the real world, what this means is when drugs come off of patent, when they come off their, their, their drug patent, and uh, what that does is it opens the doors for generic drug companies to make uh, the same drug under the generic name, right? It's like when you go in and you get a prescription, and they'll say, do you want the generic or do you want the brand? Well, if you buy the generic, it has to be therapeutically equivalent to the brand name in all respects, bioequivalency, um, pharmacokinetics, uh, all the different parameters that determine whether there is therapeutic equivalence with the brand name drug. B, the FDA considers drug products to be therapeutically equivalent if they meet the following general criteria. Okay, one, they are approved as safe and effective. Uh, you'll see, sometimes see the word efficacy uh, replaced uh, for effective. So they are approved as safe and, and effective, safety and efficacy. Two, they are pharmaceutical equivalents in that A, contain identical amounts of the same active drug ingredient in the same dosage form and route of administration, and B, meet compendial or other applicable standards of strength, quality, purity, and identity. So what does this mean? Well, it's, it's got to have the same active ingredient in there, right? If it's fluoxetine, it's got to have the same fluoxetine in the, in, the, uh, in, as in the pharmaceutical equivalent. It also has to be the same dosage form. So if it's a tablet, it's got to be a tablet. If it's a capsule, it's got to be a capsule. If it's a liquid capsule, it's got to be a liquid capsule. If it's a suppository, it's got to be a suppository. It's not therapeutically equivalent if you make a generic drug that's a capsule and the brand came in brand, uh, a tablet. Okay? Okay? All right, number three. They are bioequivalent in that A, they do not present a known or potential bioequivalence problem and they meet an acceptable in vitro standard. In vitro means that it was done like in a test tube situation, not in the body. In vivo is when it's done in the human body. In vitro is like in a lab, um, under lab conditions. <clears throat> All right. Or B, if they do present such a known or potential problem, they are shown to meet an appropriate bioequivalence standard. Okay? Four, they are adequately labeled. You have to have accurate labeling when you have um, therapeutic equivalent drugs or generic drugs that are equivalent to the brand name drugs. Number five, we're on page three. Stay with me now. They are manufactured in compliance with current good manufacturing practice or GMP regulations. Whenever you see the word GMP, it means good manufacturing practice. It doesn't just pertain to... Um, drugs. Um, it pertains to food. It pertains to anything uh, that's manufactured in the United States. There are standards for good manufacturing practice, otherwise known as GMP. Milk has GMP. Uh, Coca-Cola has GMP. Um, vitamins and supplements has GMP. When, when they have to meet these guidelines when they're manufactured in a manufacturing plant in the United States. Six, the concept the concept of therapeutic equivalence as used to develop the list applies only to drug products containing the same active ingredient and does not encompass a comparison of different therapeutic agents used for the same condition. For example, e.g., propoxyphene hydrochloride versus pentazacine hydrochloride for the treatment of pain. These are not equivalent. They're two different drugs, two different active ingredients. Okay? They may treat the same thing, they may pharmacologically do the same thing, but they are not equivalent because they are not the same chemical. They are not the same generic name. Uh, they have to be uh, therapeutically equivalent. C. The list referred to above is the FDA Orange Book. Type that in or write it in, Orange Book. Know that because I've seen this question several times on the PTCE. The list referred to above is the FDA Orange Book. One, this is a publication of approved drug products with therapeutic equivalence evaluations and identifies drug products approved on the basis of safety and effectiveness. Remember, effectiveness is efficacy by the FDA under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. Know that uh, Cosmetic Act. You're going to have all these different laws that were passed. 
If I mention it anywhere in this course, you are responsible for it and you will potentially be asked about what this uh, act or that act or this law or that law represents. Okay, so if you see it, learn it, try and memorize it. Two, the AB rating. This is what's in the Orange Book. The AB rating is the most common designation. Drugs coded as AB rated are considered therapeutically equivalent only to other drugs coded as AB under the product heading. AB is the highest rating that you can get as far as therapeutic equivalence is concerned in the Orange Book. There's A rating, there's even really bad B rating in there, but to get the highest therapeutic equivalence rating is AB rated. 1.3. Uh, drug interactions, for example, drug uh, disease, drug drug, drug food, drug dietary, uh, drug OTC, drug lab, drug nutrient, these are all drug interactions. Of course, the most common ones that you're uh, going to see working in a pharmacy as a pharmacy technician is going to be drug drug. Okay, And you usually get these uh, when you're taking the patient uh, history and profile when they're brand new to your pharmacy. Alright, so 1.3a, the definition. A drug interaction is a situation in which a substance, usually another drug, affects the activity of a drug when both are administered together or concomitantly, concurrently, together, at the same time. These uh, interactions may occur out of accidental misuse or due to lack of knowledge about the active ingredient involved in the relevant substance, substances. Okay? Drug-drug interactions, drug-food interactions, drug-lab interactions, basically just drug interactions. We have to be um, alert about any kind of drug reactions that can occur within, uh, in, in, in the patient. Remember, patient, safety, and efficacy. All right, let's turn to page four. Number one, a drug-drug interaction occurs when a drug interacts or interferes with another drug. So this can alter the way one or both of the drugs act in the body or cause unexpected side effects. Side effects that you don't want to occur. Uh, drug interactions can include A, addition or additive. In other words, the combined effect of the two drugs uh, is equal to the sum of the effects of each drug taken alone. Uh, to do this mathematically, think of 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's additive. Okay, the combined effect of the two drugs is equal to the sum of the effects of each drug separately or taken alone. B, antagonism. Antagonize, against, right? One drug works against the action of another drug. So what it means is one drug can potentially neutralize the pharmacological effect or the biological effect of another drug. Um, these are not very good drug interactions because it basically neutralizes the effect that you need from the primary drug that the patient is taking. C, potentiation. This is when one drug increases or prolongs the effect of another drug. The total effect is greater than the sum of the effects of each drug alone. An example would be Vistaril or Hydroxyzine Pamoate, the generic name, or Demerol, Meperidine, which is a opiate narcotic painkiller. And then D is synergism or synergistic. This is the joint action of drugs in which their combined effect is more intense, more intense or longer in duration than, than the sum of the effects of the two drugs alone. So synergism is, is greater than addition or an additive effect. If you want to think of it in mathematical ther terms, think of 1 plus 1 equals 3. Additive effect is 1 plus 1 equals 2. Synergistic is 1 plus 1 equals 3. It's greater than the sum of the two effects of the drugs alone. 2. A drug-disease interaction, like if you have diabetes or hypertension or cancer, a drug-disease interaction occurs when an administered drug exacerbates, makes it worse. Uh, it, it exacerbates an underlying disease in a patient. So it's a type of inappropriate prescribing or inappropriate drug therapy. Uh, an example would be taking uh, decongestants like Sudafed, pseudoephedrine, if the patient has hypertension or diabetes. Right? Pseudoephedrine, decongestant, is going to raise your blood pressure. And if you have hypertension or high blood pressure, you don't want to be taking Sudafed. This is going to exacerbate or make your hypertension or high blood pressure worse, right? There's a lot of types of reactions like this with drugs in different types of disease states. Three, 
A drug dietary supplement interaction is an interaction between a drug and a supplement such as vitamins, minerals, or herbs. Vitamins, minerals, or herbs are not classified theoretically as drugs, although um, they really are drugs because they exert a pharmacological effect on the body. However, vitamins, minerals, and herbs or supplements come under the DSHEA uh, Drug uh, Supplement uh, Dietary Act. <clears throat> Health Education and Dietary Act, I'm sorry. Um, an example is that 62% of herbal supplements have had interactions with warfarin. Warfarin, which is a blood thinner. The brand name is Coumadin. Number four, a drug OTC. Remember, OTC is over-the-counter uh, versus prescription, which is behind the counter. So anything that you buy, Tylenol, um, you know, cough syrups so like Robitussin, those are all over-the-counter, OTC. You don't need a prescription to buy products over-the-counter. Uh, so a like drug OTC interaction is an interaction between a drug and an over-the-counter product that is purchased without a prescription. For example, aspirin, which you buy over-the-counter, right, Bayer aspirin, St. Joseph's, uh, aspirin can increase the effect of warfarin, and antacids can decrease the effects of cimetidine or tagamet. Number five is a drug laboratory, laboratory interaction. And this is the kind of reaction that's between a drug and lab testing that can affect the results of the test. And this is an adverse uh, drug event. It's, it's considered an adverse drug event, ADE. Um, many drugs used today have demonstrated that they may have an effect uh, on serum potassium and creatine, creatinine uh, levels in the body. Okay, we're on page five, number six at the top of the page. Stay with me. A drug nutrient interaction is an interaction between a drug and one or more nutrients, food. One example would be foods high in vitamin K, such as spinach, broccoli, any of the green leafy vegetables, uh, kale, and that can interact with Coumadin, warfarin, a blood thinner, um, because um, it can make, um, it, it, vitamin K is actually a rescue drug for warfarin, so you don't want this kind of interaction. Uh, other examples of uh, drug food interactions will include A, improved absorption occurs if the following drugs are taken with a fatty meal, uh, ketoconazole, nitrofurantoin, and griseofulvin. Um, Sometimes you take drugs without food because it works better. But in some situations, you actually take it with food, especially like maybe a fatty meal, and it makes these types of drugs actually work better. You actually get better absorption when you, when you eat fatty foods. B, decreased absorption occurs if the following drugs are taken with food. Tetracycline, ciprofloxacin, uh, those two are antibiotics. The brand name of ciprofloxacin is Cipro, C-I-P-R-O. Atidronate, phenytoin, norfloxacin, which is another antibiotic, zidovudine, levothyroxine, and didanosine. So these can in decrease the absorption uh, of the following drugs when you take it with food. Tetracycline, if you've had acne as a teenager, if you uh, there might be a little auxiliary label on, on the vial itself that says, you know, do not take with calcium containing products or dairy products because that can decrease the absorption of the antibiotic. C, this is a relatively new type of interaction that they uh, found maybe in the last 20 years or so, is grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice affects the following drugs metabolized by the cytochrome P450 pathway. So if you take biochemistry, you're going to learn everything there is to know about cytochrome P450. Lucky for, luckily for you, you don't have to learn uh, about that pathway or biochemistry in this review course uh, to pass your exam. So, uh, grapefruit juice affects uh, any drugs metabolized by the P450 pathway. Uh, it also affects, uh, which includes, I'm sorry, which includes calcium channel blockers, uh, estrogens, cyclosporine, midazolam, and triazolam. Those are benzodiazepines, the, the latter two. Um, calcium channel blockers would be like diltiazem, verapamil. Those are a couple of examples of calcium channel blockers. 
B. Common serious drug interactions you could be tested on on the exam. 1. Coumadin or warfarin plus cipro or ciprofloxacin, biaxin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, flagyl or metronidazole, or septra or bactrim. Those are the two brand names for a combination antibiotic called sulfamethoxazole slash trimethoprim. A, the potential effect is that it increases the effect of warfarin. So warfarin is a blood thinner, and if you gave one of these drugs, it would make the warfarin work even better. And well, not necessarily better, but what it will do is it potentiates the effect, and so it could really thin out the blood, and you can bleed to death potentially. Two, Coumadin or warfarin plus aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, include a lot of the ones over the counter like ibuprofen or Motrin, naproxen or naproxen or Aleve. Um, those would be non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And again, the potential is increased bleeding. It also increases the effect of the warfarin drug. Three, Tegretol. Uh, generic is carbamazepine. This is an uh, anti-epileptic. Plus Tagamet, which is an H2 antagonist or an acid reducer, the generic name Cymetidine, erythromycin, biaxin, which is a macrolide antibiotic, otherwise known as clarithromycin, which is a generic name, or diflucan, fluconazole, which is an antifungal. And the potential effect of this is increased carbamazepine levels. It increases Tegretol. And when it increases the carbamazepine, then you can actually overdose on, on a Tegretol um, dosage. Four, dilantin or phenytoin plus tagamet, cimetidine, erythromycin, biaxin or clarithromycin, and diflucan or fluconazole. And the potential effect of this drug interaction is it increases the phenytoin levels. And again, if you increase the phenytoin levels, um, you can have an um, overdose of phenytoin or dilantin. Uh, Dilantin phenytoin is a anti-epileptic or anti-seizure drug. Five, phenobarbital plus tagamet or cimetidine. Again, tagamet cimetidine is an H2 antagonist. Erythromycin or biaxin, those are macrolide antibiotics. Uh, biaxin is a generic name again, clarithromycin or diflucan, an antifungal, generic is fluconazole. And the potential effect of this drug interaction is that it increases phenobarb levels. So again, you can OD on phenobarb. You want to make sure that you're very careful adjusting the dosages in, these, in this type of situation. Six, dilantin or phenytoin plus rifampin. Rifampin is an uh, anti-tuberculosis uh, antibiotic drug. The potential effect is that it decreases phenytoin. So if you gave rifampin to a patient on dilantin, um, it could make the dilantin less uh, effective, and the patient can then po potentially have breakthrough seizures as a result. Number seven, the drug interaction phenobarb, phenobarbital plus rifampin. The potential effect is decreased phenobarb levels. Phenobarbital, one of the um, indications is for a seizure. So uh, there could be a potential for more seizure action or activity if you give it uh, concomitantly or concurrently or together with rifampin. Number eight, oral contraceptives, right? Uh, these are birth control pills for, for women. So oral contraceptives plus rifampin uh, or any other type of uh, antibiotics or resulin, which is a anti-diabetic drug otherwise known as troglitazone, uh, the potential effect here is it could be decreased effectiveness of the oral contraception. So if you have decreased effectiveness of the oral contraception, you could get pregnant. Not a good thing. Nine, Viagra. You all know what Viagra is. You've seen a commercial a thousand times while you're watching Monday Night Football. Uh, Viagra, the generic is sildenafil. Plus nitrates, nitroglycerin, like for angina uh, or angina. The potential effect here is dramatic hypotension. This is hypotension means low blood pressure. Hypertension means high blood pressure. But here, Viagra plus a nitrate will cause dramatic hypotension. And when you have dramatic hypotension, it can cause you to faint or pass out. Number 10, statin drugs. Uh, these are the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. I'm sure you've seen these on commercials. 
probably your mom or dad or aunt or uncle or someone that you know uh, have been on one of these statin drugs. Uh, these include Lipitor or Atorvastatin, uh, Zocor, Simvastatin, uh, Crestor, Rosovastatin, Pravacol, Pravastatin, and Mevacor or Lovastatin. Uh, and so if you give it with niacin or Lopid or Gemfibrozole, which is also a, uh, for hypercholesteremia, or erythromycin, which is an antibiotic, or Sporinox, which is an antifungal, and Triconazole, uh, the potential side effect is that you have possible rhabdomyolysis. Know this term for the test, for the exam. Rhabdomyolysis is a condition in which damaged skeletal muscle breaks down rapidly uh, in the body and then includes symptoms such as muscle pain, weakness, vomiting, and confusion. And so some of the muscle breaks down, uh, the, the products break down into what's called, it's a, it's a protein called myoglobin, and myoglobin is toxic to the kidneys. It's harmful to the kidneys and it may lead to kidney failure. And so um, if you lead to kidney failure, it's fatal. You could potentially die. So that's why when people on statin drugs complain about muscle soreness, their doctor should immediately discontinue the drug because the last thing they want is for their patients to have rhabdomyolysis. Please know this term for the exam. I've seen uh, a question worded such as uh, rhabdomyolysis as a result of taking which of the following drugs. And if you see one of the statin drugs there, that's the correct answer. Um, page 7, number 11 at the top. SSRI, these are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These include Prozac, or fluoxetine, Zola, or sertraline, Celexa, or citalopram, Lexapro, or escitalopram, uh, Paxil, or paroxetine. Uh, and if you give it with Ultram, which is a an analgesic, or tramadol is a generic, uh, St. John's wort, which is an herb, or any of the tryptan, Tryptan drugs for migraine, such as uh, Emerge, which is Neurotryptan, Imatrix, which is Sumatryptan, and Zomig, which is uh, Zomatryptan. Uh, the potential side effect is what's called serotonin syndrome, or serotonin storm. Uh, this is a hypertensive crisis. Hypertensive means high blood pressure. Hypotensive means low, low blood pressure. But in serotonin syndrome, you can have a hypertensive crisis. B serotonin syndrome. So this is a group of symptoms that includes the high body temperature, um, agitation, you get increased reflexes, you kind of get these jitters and tremor, kind of like ticks, uh, sweating, you get dilated pupils, you get diarrhea, anything that stimulates a sympathetic nervous system, you'll get these types of symptoms. And ultimately, like I said earlier, it can be fatal. So tip, know this term for the exam, serotonin syndrome or serotonin storm. Uh, know all of the asterisk drugs for the exam as they, uh, these are tested often. These are also the most common of the drug uh, interactions. So I want you to know uh, these particular 11 um, drug interaction types because I've seen them on the exam. C, pregnancy categories. So, um, when pregnancy appears as a contraindication or precaution to the use of a drug, um, it is char characterized by the Food and Drug Administration under one of the five different pregnancy categories. I don't think you really need to know all five, but definitely know the last one, which we're going to get to. So category A means adequate studies in pregnant women have failed to show a risk to the fetus in the first trimester, and there is no risk in later trimesters. So, really low risk if it's category A. Pregnancy category B is animal studies have failed to show a risk to the fetus, but no adequate studies in pregnant women or animal studies have shown an, act, an adverse effect, but human studies have not shown a risk to the fetus in the first trimester, and there is no evidence of risk in later trimesters. C, or category C, animal studies have shown an adverse effect uh, on the fetus but there's no adequate studies, again, in humans, and so the benefits may outweigh the risks. So in this situation, if the benefits outweigh the risk, you would just give the drug because the risk of something uh, of hurting the patient is relatively low. D, category D, 
the positive uh, evidence of human fetal risks, but the benefits, again, outweigh the risks. So you, this is a potential situation, again, where you would give the drug because the benefits outweigh the risks. E, category X. This is the one you probably should know for the exam. This means animal or human studies have shown fetal abnormalities or toxicity, and the risk outweighs the benefits. So drugs in this category include isotretinoin, like we spoke about earlier. Accutane was the old brand name. Uh, now the brand name is Amnestine or Claritis. And another drug is thalidomide. Um, thalidomide in the 1950s caused a lot of birth defects. And the brand name is thalamide. It's still used in certain situations today, but definitely not in pregnancy. 1.4, <clears throat> strengths slash dose. Dosage forms, physical appearance, routes of administration, and duration of drug therapy. So let's start with a definition of strengths and dose. So the drug strength is the amount of drug in a given dosage form, um, a tablet, a capsule, a syrup. For example, 500 milligrams of Tylenol or acetaminophen is the strength of the tablet. That's the strength. 325 milligrams of aspirin and bare aspirin, that's the strength of the tablet. This can be used interchangeably with the dose. So when you refer to the strength or the dose of a particular drug, you're referring to how many milligrams of active ingredient there are. B, potency. Uh, potency is different and not to be used interchangeably with strength or dose. Potency refers to the relative strengths of medications that can produce the same pharmacologic or desired biological effect. The strength, uh, I'm sorry, the drug with the lowest strength to produce the desired effect is said to be the most potent. And I'm going to give you an example here in a sec. Strength does not imply anything about the potency of a drug. For example, it takes a teaspoon of sugar to acquire desired sweetness, correct? Yet only one eighth of a teaspoon, <coughs> excuse me, one eighth of a teaspoon of stevia or saccharin <coughs> produces the same level of sweetness to your mouth. So therefore, stevia or saccharin is more potent as a sweetener than regular table sugar. <coughs> excuse me about the coffee. Right, let's go to page nine C definition of dosage forms. A dosage form of a drug is the pharmaceutical drug delivery vehicle that introduces the drug to the patient, that introduces the drug to the body. Um, it has a specific uh, mixture of active and inactive or excipients uh, components. So for example, if you have fluoxetine, uh, there might be excipients or inactive products. It could be starches or some sugars or some binding, binding uh, um, particles that are in there. It's not part of the active ingredient. It's the excipient or the inactive ingredient. So depending on the route of administration or the method, uh, dosage forms come in all kinds of, of types. Sometimes the route of administration is used interchangeably with dosage form. However, it's not totally accurate because a dosage form doesn't always imply that that's going to be the route of administration. Uh, common dosage forms include, um, I mean, there's, there's many kinds of, of dosage forms, liquid, solid, semi-solid. Common forms include pills or tablets, capsules, caplets, syrups, suppositories, transdermal patches which go on the skin, eyes, eye drops, ear drops. Um, IV or intravenous, IM or intramuscular, sub-Q or subcutaneous, um, inhalers, nebulizers, uh, nebulizer solutions. And now they have inhalers that are also delivered in, 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 part of, in uh, powder particles too. So there's various uh, dosage forms that may exist for a single particular drug. Uh, and since different medications, um, I'm sorry, since different medical conditions can warrant different routes of administration. So for example, if you have persistent nausea, you know, you have nausea, you're gonna vomit, um, then it may make it difficult to use an oral dosage form, okay? Because if you swallow something, you're gonna vomit, you're gonna, you're gonna vomit it out, you're going to express it out. And so in that case, it may be necessary to use some kind of an alternative drug delivery system, such as maybe buckle, 
passages in the cheek, um, sublingual, nasal, suppository, or injection uh, in order to deliver the drug into the patient's body. So additionally, a specific dosage form may be a requirement for certain uh, kinds of drugs, as there may be issues with various factors uh, like chemical stability or maybe the pharmacokinetics of a drug. Uh, an, an example of this would be like insulin. You never see insulin available orally. Insulin doesn't come in an oral tablet or a capsule because the GI tract uh, extensively metabolizes insulin before you can, you can reach its target, uh, which is into the bloodstream. So uh, here, it's there, thereby it's, it's incapable of sufficiently reaching its therapeutic target destination. And that's why you have to give insulin uh, by injection subcutaneously. D, the definition of the physical appearance. Just what it means. The physical appearance is what a drug actually looks like to your eyes. Um, it includes dosage form, the color, the smell, the shape, the size, the solid, or, or I'm sorry, not the smell, but the dosage form, the color, the shape, the size, the so is it a solid or is it liquid? It's whatever is visible, that is the physical traits or the physical characteristics or the physical appearance of the drug. Okay, so page 10. E, definition of routes of administration. The route of administration is how the drug is delivered to the patient. Okay? So this can be oral, it can be rectal, it can be transdermal on the skin like with an ointment or a patch or, or a cream. It can be injectable as in uh, intravenous or IV or intramuscular or subcutaneous right under the skin. It could be nasal, right, like a spray. It could be buccal, it could be sublingual under the tongue. It could be a nebulizer solution for the nose. It could be an inhaler, it could be a powdered inhaler. It could be ophthalmic or eye drops. It could be otic or ear drops. Do not get mixed up with ophthalmic drops, eye drops, and otic drops, ear drops. F, the definition of drug therapy duration. So drug therapy is also known as pharmacotherapy, and receptor sites or enzymes is where drugs exert their pharmacologic action to promote uh, healthy functioning and reduce or cure the illness uh, and disease. So I can remember earlier I was talking about a drug receptor theory where you have the lock and then you have the drug which is the key which unlocks the lock and then you exerts it's your biological reaction or pharmacological reaction. Uh, so the duration of drug therapy is the amount of time, the amount of time required to obtain the desired pharmacological effect to reduce or cure the illness. And duration can be a wide range from minutes to hours to months, uh, depending on the actual disease state being treated. So for example, an antibiotic treatment can typically last maybe about a week, five days, 10 days, uh, but it could also last for as long as a year, like if you have tuberculosis, it's, uh, the mycobacterium is extremely hard to kill, and you could be on anti-tuberculosis drugs for a year. 1.5. Common and severe or adverse effects, allergies, therapeutic contraindications, precautions, warnings, and black box warnings associated with medications or drugs. There's also a PDF resource explaining the difference between contraindications and precautions and warnings, and I invite you to uh, study that resource PDF. So A, what is the definition of adverse effect? An adverse effect or adverse drug reaction, abbreviated ADR, is an expression that describes harm associated with the use of given medications at a normal dosage during normal use. ADRs may, be, may occur following a single dose or prolonged administration of a drug or result from the combination of two or more drugs. So the meaning of this expression differs from the meaning of side effect. Okay, don't, don't get it mixed up. An adverse drug reaction could be a side effect. But as this last term might also imply, that effect can be beneficial. So the study of ADRs is a concern of the field known as pharmacovigilance. But let me give you an example of a side effect that's a positive side effect. So there is a, uh, an old uh, antihypertensive or high blood pressure medication called Lonitin. It was made by Upjohn. It's the brand name for uh, for the generic minoxidil. Well, they found that whenever you took minoxidil for high blood pressure, 
you would have what was called hirsutism. It was unwanted hair growth around the body. Well, the Upjohn scientists said, hey, we could use this side effect and make hair grow on top of head. It would solve male pattern baldness. And so that's what they did. They uh, took the same drug that was used for high blood pressure, and they slapped out a new proprietary brand name and called it Rogaine, right? Rogaine. That's what you can buy that now over the counter. That is a side effect, a positive side effect, in which they got a different indication for the drug. So again, do not um, interchange them. A side effect can also be a, a good uh, effect other than just an adverse uh, drug effect. All right, page 11, B, the definition of allergies. So a drug allergy is the abnormal reaction of your immune system to a medication, just as there are food, supplement, and environmental allergies. A drug allergy is not the result of a stomach ache or a headache or a dizziness due to an allergy. The most serious type of allergy is anaphylactic shock. Like you've heard of people getting bee stings and then they die, uh, that's anaphylactic shock. Or maybe they eat peanuts, you know, uh, they're extreme allergic to peanuts, they can have an anaphylactic shock and die. So anaphylactic shock is life-threatening. Um, any medication or OTC prescription or herbal product is capable of inducing a drug allergy. However, a drug allergy is more likely with certain medications, like penicillins, for instance. The most common signs and symptoms of drug allergies are, get ready, fill it in, or type, or type it in, or write it in, hives, rashes, or fever. Hives, rashes, or fever. So if you're a pharmacy technician and you're doing an intake for a brand new patient at your pharmacy and they say, oh yeah, I've been on this antibiotic before, I'm allergic because I got a stomach ache or a headache. That is not an allergy. That is not an immune response. But if they told you they had, they broke out into hives, they had problems breathing, they had fever, that could be a true drug allergy. So one, true drug allergies are rare and caused by the immune system. It's an immune response. An allergic reaction is an abnormal response of the immune system to a normally harmless substance. Peanuts, normally harmless substance, right? Uh, these are called IgE antibodies, and they react with substances and cause allergy symptoms. C, definition of contraindication. A contraindication is a condition or factor that serves as a reaction to withhold a certain drug or medical treatment. So one, some contraindications are absolute, meaning that there are no reasonable circumstances for undertaking a course of action. For example, Children and teenagers with viral infections should not be given aspirin because of the risk of Ray's syndrome. And a person with an anaphylactic food allergy, like with peanuts, should never eat the food to which they are allergic. Those are contraindications, okay? It's a condition or factor that you withhold at all times. There could be a drug-drug contraindication. You have to withhold the drug that's going to cause that contraindication. D, the definition of precaution. A precaution alerts you to exercise care necessary for the safe and effective use of the medication being used. You will see all these types of um, contraindication, warnings, precautions. They're always going to be in the pack, pack, uh, patient package insert of the drug. <clears throat> Let's go to page 12. We're almost done here. E, definition of warning. So a warning alerts you to potentially serious outcomes, death, injury, or adverse effects to the user or the patient. F, definition of black box warning. This is the serious, most serious type. So a black box warning is the most serious kind. It appears in a box that appears on a patient packaged drug insert for certain prescription drugs. It literally is in a black box. Uh, the FDA can require a pharmaceutical company to place a boxed warning on the labeling of a prescription drug uh, or in the literature describing its black box warning, describing the actual warning. It is the strongest warning. Write this down, type it in. It is the strongest warning that the FDA requires and signifies that medical studies indicate the drug carries a significant risk of serious or 
even life-threatening adverse effects. So again, I'll give you the example of Accutane, which is isotretinoin for recalcitrant acne. Uh, Accutane is no longer available, but Soret and Clarivus and Amnestine are still available on the market. It has a black box warning on the box on the patient package insert. And it says, for females, warning them that pregnancy while on the drug can cause birth defects, otherwise known as ter uh, teratogenicity, or it's a ter teratogenic, genic meaning causing. 1.6, the dosage and indication of legend OTC medications, herbal and dietary supplements. So A, a legend drug is a prescription drug. A prescription drug is a legend drug, okay? In other words, a drug that requires a handwritten or electronic or verbal prescription uh, from a prescriber. Prescribers are anyone that can prescribe drugs. Physicians, dentists, doctors, physicians, physicians and assistants, nurse practitioners, um, doctor of osteopath, veterinarians, etc. They can write for legend drugs. B, on the other hand, OTC is not a legend drug. OTC is over the counter. So these are uh, products, drugs and other medications, and even supplements and herbs that are available without a prescription and can just go into a pharmacy and buy it over the counter and bring it up to the cashier. C, Herbal and dietary supplements also don't require a prescription because they are regulated as food. The FDA regulates herbs and supplements as food, vitamins. They include herbal formulations and vitamin supplements in singular form or in combination like a multivitamin complex. Okay, the final one. Lucky number 13. We're here, guys. D. An indication for a drug refers to the use of that drug for treating a particular um, disease. So, for example, diabetes is an indication for insulin. Depression is an indication for Prozac. Erectile dysfunction is an indication for Viagra. So manufacturers pay a lot of money to get indications for their drugs. If something is being used to treat a disease that is not an indication for the drug in the patient package inserted in the literature, that is called off-label use. And there are some liabilities involved with off-label use because it wasn't originally indicated uh, for that use for that particular drug. Okay guys, we are done. Uh, we are done with 1.0. I will see you in 2.0. Uh, hang in there. Uh, we got uh, a long path, a long journey to go.